Hello, founders. We are live. Welcome to startups.com. Hope you're all having a wonderful day. Appreciate all the support. It's been fantastic. Today, as part of our episode, we got a good one planned for you. I'm going to go through pitch decks. I'm going to go through as many as I possibly can and provide some feedback. These pitch decks have been sent to me by people all around the interwebs on YouTube. And my kudos to anybody who sends me their pitch deck and is willing to have a live review or recorded review. And hopefully there's a learning experience for everyone. I'm looking forward to hanging out and sharing. Just a little thought, if you are in the audience right now and you have some questions, there's a Q&A box. I got my co-pilot, Jen, with me. She's going to be watching that and the chat and all the questions that might come up. You want to ask those immediately up front because I want to be able to answer them. So if you've got a question in your mind, type it into the Q&A box right now. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a visual marker to help when it comes to pitch decks or really anything related to startups. Type your question into the Q&A box right now. Jen is gonna watch for that and we're gonna answer that. In the meantime, as those questions roll in, I'm going to be going through pitch decks. And let me just start by saying, just my opinion, my background, seven time funded five or two exits, raised over $100 million of funding for my startups, other people's startups and startup funds. I work with a team that's raised over $750 million for startups and we see pitch decks. I look at like literally 10 pitch decks a day and I can only share from me my experience of what investors are responding to and the pitch decks that I've seen that I've written checks. That's the basis, the foundation of where I'm coming from. Lots of other opinions out there, but we want to help you and hopefully we can all learn together and you can walk through and start to understand what investors are looking for, especially when it comes to how we process the ideas. I'm going to explain to you, this is how I look at an idea and what goes through my head. So you empathize with the investor and you can begin to work on your own pitch deck. So feel free to ask questions, reach out. As always, join us on startups.com. We got a lot of free resources to help out. And let's look at this first pitch deck right here. I have not looked at this pitch deck yet. I am looking at this right from scratch, right from inception, if you will, and my opinion. We have this pitch deck, it's called Zero Rin. Zero Rin, I hope I pronounced that correctly. And it says, helping people pay off their debt faster and save money. I like this because it's just very straightforward in terms of what this pitch deck really is going to tell me what I should be expecting. I got some cool little images on the front interface. Yeah, cover slide should always be just very straightforward. Don't put any kitschy marketing slang or slogans. Don't put any buzzy words in there. Just very straightforward. I like it. Helping people pay off their debt faster and save money. Problem. Currently, 225 million Indians have an active debt and one out of six Indians owes more than 2x what they own. Okay, this is a little bit of an issue. I know the ESL can be a challenge. That's what ChatGPT is for, right? Use it, but let's keep reading. People often struggle with managing multiple debts, leading to financial, emotional stress, poor credit scores, and debt traps. And then we've got these bullet points, key issues, difficulty in tracking multiple debts, lack of proper financial planning, lack of strategies for debt clearance. Basically, all this is saying the same thing. We could have consolidated it. Now, the good thing is with this deck is we have the size, scope, and severity of the problem in numbers. And you want to put that in there so it's not just opinion. Can't just say, like if this deck said, Indians are in debt, too many Indians are in debt and it's killing them. Well, that's your opinion, right? So the fact that we've got size, scope, and severity. So let's look at, we got 225 million Indians have active debt and one out of six Indians owe more than two X what they own. Now we can consolidate that because now you're giving me conflicting information, right? So 225 million Indians are in debt and X percent of them owe more than two X, you know, some of them, okay? Or is it one out of six Indians owe two X more than what they owe, right? So just Simplify it and say 225 millions are in, in debt and X percent of that debt is two times more their net worth, right? And then people often struggle with managing multiple debts, leading to financial, emotional stress, poor credit scores, et cetera. This is almost like a second problem statement, problem statement number two. So you could easily just add it in right here. So let's wordsmith this together. You can say 225 million Indians are in debt. And let's look, I'm, I'm just going to make sure that I have my numbers correctly. Um, let's see if we hit, is it 225? Is it one out of six of those 225 million? Right? So is it like 16%? That's not a big enough number. So you can say 225 million Indians have debt with some of them owing more than 2x what they owe because of 
poor credit scores or because they lack access to tools to help them pay their debt, something along those lines. So notice how I've taken all this and I put it into one sentence right here. And we could actually do this as an exercise. Let me do this here. So watch what I do, everyone, and I'm gonna explain how I did this. I could basically go and go to ChatGPT, and I'm gonna do this, right? And I'm gonna say, all right, ChatGPT, and bear with me here so that I show my screen. I just load up ChatGPT, new conversation. Here we go. Please excuse me, I use dark mode. And I'm gonna type in, combine all this information. Oh, sorry, my typing is terrible. Into a one sentence problem statement for statement for a startup pitch deck okay and then i'll load in my inputs so i've got that now i've got these other bullet points right so i got key issues and i got difficulty tra tracking okay so i'm going to type this in here so i put key issues right there and then i'm going to load the next one lack of proper financial planning and i'm just going to take all this and sometimes you just dump a whole bunch, a stream of consciousness into your pitch deck and that's okay right because chat gpt is your friend use it i use chat gpt all the time to respond to my pitch deck and i'm just going to start give me a one sentence for a problem statement for a startup pitch deck actually i'm going to say give me three options sometimes i like to do that how Okay, here we go. All right, so you see my choices. 225 million Indians struggle with managing multiple debts, leading to financial stress, poor credit scores, and debt traps due to lack of tracking tools, financial planning, and debt clearance strategies. So notice how ChatGPT immediately took out the one for six. Or the second one, with one for, one in six Indians owing more than twice what they own, managing multiple debts is overwhelming, causing poor financial stress, long-term debt due to inadequate planning, tracking solutions. Okay? Millions of Indians face financial, emotional stress, mismanaged debts driven. That's a weak one because it doesn't put in there. So I would say the strongest one is this last one, and it's the 225 million number. See, and then you can massage it and put it in there. But notice how that is going to be a lot better than all these paragraphs and these bullet points. So that is what we're looking at. Okay, let me go back to this slideshow here. Okay, so there's your problem. All right, so the solution is Zero Rin is a debt management app designed to help individuals manage their debts in one single platform. It helps in paying off debts faster, save money in the process, and achieve the financial goal of emotional relief. All right, I like this. It's pretty good because guess what? If I go back, this is the principle. If my problem is that something is slow, manual, and expensive, then the solution needs to be fast, automated, and cheap. So what's good about the solution is it addresses all the issues in the problem slide, which is great. It actually does that straightforward. Now, I would also like to know a few numbers. If you have a way to say pay off debts faster, okay, or pay off debt and figure it out, like how much faster could you extrapolate? Maybe not, but that always helps. But let me give you another exercise. Okay, so we're gonna go back to ChatGPT, right? And I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna feed all the inputs. So I'm gonna put it in there and I say, okay, um, I like option one. I'm gonna say, I like option one. ChatGPT is going to acknowledge that it liked option one, memory updated, great choice. Okay, and I'm gonna say, here is what I have for a problem statement. Um, rewrite it into one sentence so that it matches and aligns with solving the problem statement. Okay, did I spell that correctly? All right, so then I'm gonna do here, then I'm gonna add centralized debt tracker, right? Now some of this you could actually put into the how it works, like, you know, centralized debt tracker, but let's see what it comes up with. And I'm just gonna keep putting in debt clearance strategies, okay? And then a last bullet point here, AI power budget analysis, right? Now, if you're gonna put AI in there, you should probably lead with AI because that's gonna be the hot thing. So I'm gonna say, make sure the uh, solution statement, uh, let's say it leads with being AI based, okay? ChatGPT goes to work. Zero is an AI powered debt management app that helps individuals centralize their debt tracking, implement personal debt clearance strategies, and accelerate payments to take money and achieve, to save money and achieve both financial and emotional relief, right? One sentence said everything in these decks. And that's the reason you want to use ChatGPT. All right, so let's take a look. So, so far, pretty good in terms of problem solution, got the raw data. This is just refining it down into one clear sentence, but not bad so far. Let's continue. The next market opportunity, thank you so much. Market opportunity is very important. Your deck should go problem, solution, market opportunity, unless you've got a really good reason to mix it up. So we have here $360 billion in loans were distributed from digital lending platforms 2023 with year-over-year 33.5%. All right, 
big issue. That is not your TAM. That's not your total addressable market. That's how much $360 billion in, uh, uh, like how much in loans was given out. Are you saying that's your market? Because as far as I'm concerned, this is not a loan company. This is an app to help people save money. So what does loans have to do with it? I know people are in debt, okay? But that is going to be pointless. So we're going to get rid of this. We're going to say, all right, get rid of this. Okay, so we have 225 million individuals have active debt. So what's the address of a market? So we're saying that if all 225 people times how much money your company, all 225 million people used it times how much money would be $2.4 billion is your market. If that's the case, then that is a bottom up, up analysis, which is really good. Okay. So now we focus on reaching 20 million people, a serviceable market. So this is Sam, 20 million people, right? So earning $11 a per uh, annual subscription. So 220, 220 or 20 million people times $11 per year. That's the focus. Now here's the problem. We focus on reaching 20 million people. Why? Why those 20 million people? This is good. This is a good slide because it's a bottom-up analysis. But if you're going to say we're focusing on 20 million people, who are they? Why are you focusing on them? 20 million people who are the most in debt, 20 million people who've got at least good credit scores, who've got jobs to help them. What is the focus there to let you expand? Because if you've got 225 million people in debt, and 20 million is less than 10%, great. Good number to focus on. But what's the logic behind that? That's what the investor is going to be asking. Every single time that you explain your market, you have to show the logic because it has to be battle tested. The investor is going to ask you, how did you come up with that 20 million number? And if it sounds arbitrary, and if you say, this is the typical thing, we're going to hit 10% of our market. That doesn't mean anything to the investor. In fact, the investor, you know what I think? You're lazy. You are lazy and you're not prepared to actually have a proper go-to-market strategy where you know which people are going to focus, are going to be the main focus. That's the beachhead strategy. Every investor, a good investor, will want to know what is your beachhead strategy. Like Facebook said, we are going to dominate Harvard. You cannot get on Facebook unless you have a Harvard email address. And then we're going to do, where they go next? Stanford, I think it was. And then it was like MIT or different places. Then they started expanding. They could have stayed in college the whole time and it would have been a good business. But they said, eventually everyone's gonna have Facebook, but we're gonna start with Harvard, then colleges, and then we're gonna go to the rest of the world because it's gonna take on a life of its own. That's called a beach head strategy. What beach are you landing on to establish your dominance, wedge yourself in there and grow and win the war? So the missing thing on this pitch deck is what is the logic of the 20 million people? Other than that, pretty good. I like it. Business model. I love the order these slides are going in. I would prefer, this is just my thing, a how it works slide after market. So it goes problem, solution, market, how it works, then business model. But let's take a look. Premium until we reach five, five to 10,000 users. That means absolutely nothing, all right? You don't know if you need to knock yourself out of freemium, just say freemium, right? Just say we're using a freemium strategy right now to attract users. So get rid of this. We charge annual subscription, da da da. We take five to ten percent on the outstanding debt of additional services like debt relief program. In the future, we plan to expand business beyond debt management, right? Maybe you can put in this, but ah, uh, you know, you don't really need this. This is powerful enough as it is. So you say we start with a freemium and then we charge a I I'm sorry, I don't know the currency over in India but it's the $11 and then we take five to 10%, right? Now here's the thing. It would have been a lot better if there was a how to work slide that told me that you're gonna start offering program for debt consolidation, you know, all that stuff. But as far as I'm concerned, this slide, straightforward, simple. We're doing pretty good as far as this deck is concerned so far, digging it. Compared now, so I'm still missing a how it works slide, which is gonna be a major issue because you know how, you know the reason we want how it works slide is because sure you're tackling the problem, but the how it works slide tells us how you're different, why it's going to work now. And have you thought it through and can you explain it simply enough? There are so many at companies or financial management or financial health apps that are out there. So explain to me how it works, explain to the AI. You scan all your receipts and you take pictures of everything, you send in your bank account, and then the, the AI matches you to all the debt consolidation programs and gives you a journal every single day and you calculate it out and then it tells you, hey, you're doing really well. I don't know, something along those lines, but explain it simple. I would never use more than six steps, steps to explain the user journey. And sometimes you need the user journey and sometimes you need the, the company journey if it's a marketplace or things, just user discretion. But tell me how this works because right now 
it sounds like you're pro- you're promising a whole bunch of things, but you really don't have any substance behind it, right? I don't know. You're gonna charge this money, but I don't know how this app works. Like, is it in virtual reality, augmented reality? Does it work with your WhatsApp? Does it do funny things, sing you songs? You know, play music for you every time you're gonna overspend on your credit card? I don't know what it looks like. But educate me and explain to me how this is going to work. So let's look at the competitive analysis. First of all, I have no idea if I'm going to be pitching investors outside of India, you better start explaining. What is this? Like, it makes no sense. I don't even know what this is. This is like a symbol. I have no idea what that is, right? So you got zero and you got your typical thing. Now, here's the important thing with the competitive analysis. One, two competitors is not enough. It is not going to be enough unless there's a reason. Have a headline up top here and say zero in is the only app that adds this, this, blah, 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 et cetera, right? So, you know, let's take a look at it. Now, if I would have known there's AI-powered budgeting, that would have helped in the How It Works slide. So I keep harping on the How It Works slide. But you need more, you need more competitors to show that you're not being short-sighted. And also, you need other indirect competitors such as financial coaches. Like, I don't know if those appear in India. But talk about the different companies that are trying to solve the problem, maybe not in the same way with an app. I don't know if that's what you're doing here, and that's the problem. I'm missing this information. So educate me on what's going on. And I like these. These are um, here good in terms of this is what the customer wants. So pretty good competitive analysis slide. I dig it. Traction. MVP is in progress. 180 plus users in wait list, two months. Okay, so let's just scan this. Okay, here's the founder and the ask. All right, so let's go back. So now I know why there isn't a how it works slide. Because the founder, I'm assuming, hasn't thought it through. Now, this founder may take some very big exception to him. Like, but Ed, I have thought it through. How do I know you've thought through? I have no idea if you have or not. So if you're at MVP stage, as soon as I see there's a lack of I've thought it through and it's how it works and you're telling me you're building an MVP, I automatically assume you have no idea. You're just shit up against the walls and hoping that it sticks. That's my immediate assumption. Why? Because I have seen hundreds of decks. I literally see up to 10 decks every single day. I found her, send me decks like this all over the interwebs, and I've seen patterns and patterns and patterns. And I know when a founder is trying to pull the wool over and say, ah, don't worry about that. I'm building an MVP. I'm going to figure it out. No, no, that's not how it works. If you've done the idea validation, you know how your MVP works, and you can clearly state step-by-step step how it's going to work, and that's what would have made this a lot better. On top of which, you tell me that you're building AI, you haven't explained to me where your AI is coming from, how it's going to work. An AI costs millions of dollars to make if you're doing it the old-fashioned hard way and, tr- hard way and training it on data and making it proprietary. You may say, here's what we've done. Okay, that's great. But how do I know? The fact that you haven't given me that information makes my mind go into the dark places and I start making up stuff and you don't want me making up stuff, stories about you. Uh, That is a very bad sign, right? So 180 plus users in a wait list in two months and growing, currently onboarding from single subreddit. Okay, that doesn't really help. Um, If you go to Reddit and you say, all right, who wants to be out of debt, you know, super quick? I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. You're onboarding from where? Like, what are you onboarding them to? This is, does not make sense, okay? So MVP is in progress. Tell me how you validated. We need more traction to go with this. Next, we go to team, okay? Madan is here. Half a decade of experience in product development. Half a day, five years, that's not a lot. So I would just say experience product development. I like the logos. Experience in crypto insurance, decentralized technologies. Recently became debt-free. I appreciate that, okay? Good job. I don't have enough bullet points, and you're not explaining to me what domain expertise that you bring, but it's okay, all right? Now, are you technical? Looks like you are experienced product development, building multiple. I don't know if you're technical or not, but you just want to be super clear. And on top of which, Neptune Mutual, Invest, Investa X, um, what were you doing at those companies? That's important. The ask, we're raising 120K pre-seed to complete our mobile beta version and test it with 5K users. We are looking to get product market fit in 7 to 12 months. Okay, so we got to break down our funds. I heard this happen today um, before, and you don't want to use the term product market fit or all these terms to make yourself sound smarter or razzle dazzle. Product market fit means different things for different people. And on top of which, in this case, product market fit is being used wrong. You will not get product market fit in seven to 12 months. And the fact that you even say that you think you can get product market fit in seven to 12 months is completely erroneous. It's a pie in the sky fantasy statement. Just say we are raising 120K to complete our app and begin beta testing with users within six months or something along those lines. That's your pre-seed. Now let's talk about pre-seed for a moment. Pre-seed is when you ask for money and you really haven't generated any signs of product market fit. You're just not there. You're probably validating an MVP. Maybe you've made some money. It's the Wild West. 
Pre-seed, there's no formal category for pre-seed out in investor land, in institutional. They call it early stage for a reason because it's all over the place. Pre-seed would be friends, family, associates, rich aunts and uncles that say, oh, they're there. Look forward to what you have to do and what you have to try. If you want an institutional investor to invest early stage pre-seed, you better have traction and you better understand what you're trying to build and have more information to de-risk the investment to give them confidence that you have what it takes. And right now, this deck, it does not have enough information. Problem solution market, pretty good, right? Good foundation. You can refine it a lot more, but you have it, de-risk the investment. Now, if you have a rich aunt and uncle, like I said, who says, wow, I really want to see you succeed. I'm just going to YOLO the money. I've written those checks before. I've written checks to people just like, I just want to help you succeed. You don't know if you're going to do it, but I may never see my money again. I'm probably going to act like I never see my money again. Here's a check. That's a pre-seed angel early stage investment. But if you want other investors that you don't know to take you seriously, this deck is missing some serious slides, like how it works, right? Go to market strategy and a lot more detailed information in terms of traction and what you're doing, which is going to uh, continue to uh, affect you you know, as you go along, all right? So there's that deck, let's check this out. So this is a redo of Project Done, and this is my main man, Peter Wolf. You know, he, he adjusted it and he wants me to take a look at his new deck. Now, if it's a second time around, I'm gonna explain it to everyone like you watch the first time, but I'm gonna be a little harder and I'll explain the reason I do that because you gotta learn your lessons as you do it. Right, Project Done is a project execution platform with proactive AI and human talent support for startups. Okay, so straightforward, I like it. Always did. There are over 3.5 million early stage tech startups today, and over 50% of them are making mistakes like, now this is where we got the problem. I'm not gonna read all those bubbles. Just give it to me in one sentence. Like, or, or just don't get tricky and just say blanket statement that, that they mismanage their money in you know these things. And then you add, which often lead to their failure losing 25 to 150K a year. It makes no sense whatsoever because you haven't established what's going on, 90% of stars fail. So how do you consolidate all this together? Just give it to me in one, one statement. 90% of stars fail, or 90% of 3.5 million uh, act today. Like all the percentages are all over the place, or 50% making mistakes. The big thing, out of 3.5 million stars, 90% of them will fail right? You can just give that number. will fail because they are mismanaging money or because I liked the first version because they're spending too much on talent, right? And, and outsourcing, etc. Consolidate all that together. Not going to read. Nobody's going to go through this maze of colors and then come and then extrapolate what your problem statement is because you've led them through this sort of wild goose chase. Just tell me in one big sentence up at the top. Like I said, I'm going to be a little harsher here. Next solution, digital platform that, you know, this is what I'm going to say, go back and do exactly what I did in terms of all the different uh, combination that you did chat GPT, feed all that information into chat GPT. So go to chat GPT and say, here's what I have for my problem statement, put it in a one sentence for a startup pitch deck that investors will love something like that. So now I'm going to say digital platform that offers affordable access, talent, project execution, AI, freedom to scale teams idea. Okay. So we're not solving the problem apples to oranges in the sense that the problem's all over the place and therefore the solution's all over the place. And they say from zero to IPO, hyperbolic statement. Let me make a comment on hyperbolic statements in your pitch deck. We are gonna transform and revolutionize this statement from zero to IPO. We help, that's a buzzy slang term for customers. Talk to your investors. When you say statements like, now you can save money and you can transform your entire life. You are not talking to the investor. You are talking to the customer. Customers love that type of stuff. Investors can't stand it. It just distracts and you're just making hyperbolic statements and you're not really leading with hardcore evidence that your startup is going to be successful. And that's the issue with this is, and, and, and Peter's a marketing guy and I get it, it's not gonna help. This is not helping. So let's go back into this problem statement. So imagine the problem statement is 90% of startups fail or 3.5 million. So let's do this here. So let's. Just do the math. I, I really should be able to do this in my head. The good Asian I should be, but I'm not. So I'm going to say, okay, 3.15 million startups will fail because they're making financial mistakes of hiring, of talent management, all that stuff. Just straightforward. I don't have to have all those bubbles, you know, et cetera. I don't have to put it in there. Just say, all these startups are going to fail. 3.15 million startups are going to fail. They don't have to. Our platform, okay, reduces those hiring costs using AI. That's it. Our platform reduces those hiring costs and helps with project management using AI, something along those lines. You see how simple that is? Again, I don't know if you're just trying to pitch 
uh, founders, but investors not interested. Maybe this is. I don't know this. This I think this is an investor deck. Better be an investor deck, or else I'm I'm barking up the wrong tree. How it works. So now we got all these this interface, and we've got all this stuff, and that is not the way that I want to see how it works. Like. I have to decipher. As Ryan Rattan said in our last pitch deck review, the burden is on the sender, not the reader. The burden is on the founder to make the pitch deck understandable and legible, not the investor to sit there and go, oh yeah, I understand. Let me look through all the interface and let me look through all the details. I'd rather see you say something just straightforward, something like user signs up, uploads their project, puts in the details. AI creates a project management plan. AI recommends talent. Scan talent, sign contracts, hire them, and then follow along in your execution board. Something along those lines. Just give me a step-by-step -step play. Give me a step-by-step, box-by-box, how it works on how the user is going to have an amazing experience to the point where they get a wonderful fairy tale ending. The user is like, I I I'm amazed. And explain it to the investor in a way that shows them your secret sauce, your unique insight, Give it to them differently. Right now, give me a laundry list and making me look at a slide, it's not gonna work if you're trying to raise money. Now I understand, I think Peter tried to get into a, an accelerator. I think he got accepted an accelerator. This might work for accelerators that want you, know, you to come in, but they're not writing you these big checks, right? And if I'm an investor, I need to write you a half million dollar check, this slide is not gonna help me. I don't understand how it works. You just give me a whole bullet point of features it's not how it works. Next, secret sauce. Talent for 40% cheaper. Talents can work for more clients, save 10% for buyers. No chit chat focuses on work, saves 10% buyers. No hiring overhead costs, 20% for buyers. You're making a lot of assumptions here, worth up to 10% deduction for talents, all right? Freedom over, over working hours. We keep 20% talents pay, and they are still happy with it. I'm having a hard time believing this, but I'm gonna say, give you the benefit of the doubt, this could be presented a lot differently and just in a better story in that you know our talent is willing to work for 40% less because they have they don't have to talk to you. They've got freedom and you know, things like that. Like just this, you're putting so much data in my mind that I'm just starting to receive that friction. I don't know. Also examples of this actually happening would be helpful as well. Okay, business model. So first the freemium, okay? Uh, Freemium user growth software sub 25 premium user growth. Okay. So again, I'm super confused. You see how I had to stop and look through all the bubbles. Just say we have a freemium. We have a software subscription package for $25 a month and then access to talent. We do $2,000 a month, minimum cost per client. All right. And, and that's how it works. Now, my understanding is we take 20% from our talents pay. That's your business model. How come that's not in here? I don't understand how that works. This is how you make money. So this sentence, we keep 20% of our talents pay needs to be incorporated into the business model. Market size, remember everyone, problem, solution, market size. Say it with me, everyone. Problem, solution, market size. Problem, solution, market size. Time calculation. Okay, so if every early stage startup, this is bottom up, I like it. $1,200, that's $4.2 billion. Great, those are all the startups that are struggling with it. Estimated LTV, 2,000, what? Now, how, why am I getting in a lifetime value? So Sam, 2.1 bill, you haven't shown me your math. I don't get it. Is your Sam the yellow? Now we're getting too complicated. This, I, I like the bottom up, but again, we got the, the, the sin of we're not explaining why you're targeting your Sam. And then your Sam obviously is right there. And that percentage, all these little percentage things mean absolutely nothing. So what you're telling me is that you believe this is 100% of your market right here, okay? Tam is 100% of your market, and you're going to hit 50% of your market? You're gonna focus on 50% of your market? What size of market is that? It, that makes no sense. Like what, why? Give me an understanding, and then some 5%. So if we do 5% of the Tam, we're gonna make $105 million. You are completely making erroneous statements. You're not putting in the work to show investors that you have figured it out. Here's how I would do it, and just as a demonstration, not necessarily saying this is right. So you say out of the 3.5 million startups, this is our Tam, $4.2 billion. They'll spend $100 a month with us. We are going to focus on startups that require heavy freelancer, you know, all this stuff. We, we calculated that B2C startups will be our best target market. And there's going to be currently 1 million of those, okay? Times 1,200 is a $1.2 billion market. Those are the ones we're gonna focus on. We believe that we can achieve our sum of $105 million based upon our projections, all those things. So this is not fully fleshed out yet. And again, we're throwing all these numbers out there and we're just causing more cognitive friction. Go to market strategy, venture startups. Focus on VC-backed startups first. So this is the issue is, Okay, can you tell me that there are 3.5 million VC-backed startups or you're 50% you're of their VC-backed? I don't think so, okay? 
easy to find that they've had cash on hand. They need talents to most startup events. So you haven't told me any special sauce on how and why you think you can attract BC startups. Here's the thing. When you put out a go-to-market strategy, it must be believable. In other words, you can't get it to the point where the investor says, I don't believe you. But the investor may say, I don't know if that would work because I don't have experience, but I believe you could pull it off based on the data that you're presenting me. So you have to make your go-to-market strategy believable. Now, I happen to have experience with VC-backed startups. And one, I question the number. I don't think there are 3.5 million or even half that VC-backed startups. And you're telling me you're going to go to startup events, visit live events. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Maybe if you give me some numbers, but I don't believe it. Why? Because I'm in that business. I'm in the business of helping startups. And you haven't proven to me anything. And this is the reason when you have a go-to-market strategy, the more numbers that you put in there, we test it. Let me give you an example. I'm going to just put out there super quick. I'm going to explain to you and I'm showing you a test that I'm running right now. Okay. This is, a, this is an advertising test. And these are the numbers that a, a, a VC, an institutional investor is going to look for. Okay. Take a look. Don't hold me. This is just my first experiment. So I got this experiment on this company, Royal Road. And I'm looking at it and I've spent $55 to test my go-to-market strategy. Can I put this and I, I got an ad. So I'm going to test ads, right? So right now my click-through rate is 0.29%. I'm paying 20 cents per CPM, right? Now I'm going to refresh that. I'm going to see if it changed. Refresh and I'm watching this like a hawk. Um, so I got, it's still 0.29%. Okay, so it, it did update. I got nine clicks. That's not good. That's a piss poor click-through rate. 0.29%. On average, as I studied out of the market and I'd done the research, I should be around 1.5 to 3 point something percent for initial campaign. Why am I showing you this? In a go-to-market strategy, if I can tell you, listen, we are paying 20% for 1,000 and we're doing a 3% click-through rate, which equates to a lifetime value. I've already done this. I have the math. I have the receipts to show you and here's the optimization that we're doing, the investor's gonna believe me because I've done it, I have data. But if you're saying, I think we're gonna attend events, I think I'm gonna do this, I think I'm gonna do direct, direct mail, and you don't have any data behind it, that's not a go-to-market strategy, it's gonna instill confidence in an investor. Maybe a mom and pop shop or your rich aunt and uncle who's like, they're there, I believe you, you know, all those things, right? Let me show you another slide or another thing that I could demonstrate for you as a go-to-market. So this is my, uh, this is my YouTube. Now, what I can show you is this is my go-to. I can say I am experimenting with YouTube as my go-to-market strategy. And I go down here and look at all the data and the numbers that I've shown. And now look at all this has happened, which I figured out. Okay, boom. Now, I got an excuse here in this section. I got sick, right? And I didn't put out any content. But now it's taking back up. If I can get this keep going back up and I can explain how many videos. Look, how many videos, how many users and all this stuff on a week by week basis and i can show 10 percent week over week growth and i've proven my market strategy that's traction but i'm explaining that traction has occurred because i know my market strategy i've actually done it and i've tried it so put out some real evidence people okay nothing stops you from putting out a 50 dollars test and explaining that's going to do a lot better than just putting a laundry list of go-to-market strategies out there that's going to say hey i think we know what we're doing Campaigns, great right? campaigns. I have no data on those campaigns. Product hunt launch, I don't, doesn't mean anything to me. Automation, build out a solid sales funnel. How do I know that you're actually gonna do it? Organic videos, how do you know your videos are gonna grow organically? Give me something or say, we're gonna experiment with all these things because this is what we've learned. We've interviewed our audience and this is what they're gonna respond to. Competition, all right? So, okay, selling talents. So this is way that it goes products is very difficult to understand. I would have to spend lots of time. I'd rather see features and benefits matrix or a magic quadrant. I'm just going to take for granted that you have studied your competition, but it's not presented in a way that I'm going to understand, right? And again, overall, the design of this deck, like it's a good, it's a good looking deck, right? But it's just so tricky that I'm having a hard time figuring out where I need to look. Okay, here's the team, third time star final, 10 years in business, you know, all the bullet points, etc. Okay, great traction. What we achieved so far? So far, writing a single without writing a single line of code. Okay, don't say that. That's dumb. Um, it, it's just you're trying to be clever and just say with our you know no code MVP or whatever with our MVP. MVP based on a sales paid two smartly designed contracts both parties. Okay, so traction twenty three hundred upfront fee. So here's the thing: if you've got paying clients, how did you get them? Like just explain. Like if you got paying clients. 
by doing founder-led sales or you are already in a startup network, say that. I've got a pitch deck that I'm building for a founder and have Hollywood contacts. I said, tell me how many Hollywood contacts you got and put that in your go-to-market strategy. Because everybody else is going to say, wow, trying to sell to A-list Hollywood contacts. I don't know if you can just contact whatever, um, uh, Brad Pitt or Sigourney Weaver or I don't know, just thinking about all these people, like who is Ridley Scott coming out with new Gladiator movie. You're not going to be able to contact them. But these these two guys have Hollywood contacts. I say, yeah, you've been in Hollywood. We're going to contact them first and do direct hand-to-hand -hand combat sales. And then we're going to contact schools. And then we're going to do this, do that. If that's how you got your first clients, then say that, right? Don't be tricky and just say, right now we are doing hand-to-hand -hand combat sales. And this is what we're learning. And we already landed a deal of 2,300 pounds, 6,000 pounds, et cetera. Okay. That's great. So share that and keep that growing. But here's the other issue is that I am not seeing any growth in these numbers. This is not traction. If you just two contracts, I'm not seeing any growth, right? So figure out how you're going to explain your traction in terms of growth metrics. Raising, we're raising $500,000, develop an awesome project assistant AI and to reach um, 50,000 MRR in the next 24 months, right? Use the funds. Okay, so let's go back to what I've been saying. You're telling me you're raising money for an AI and you haven't told me how your AI is going to work. Do you see the problem here? You see where I would struggle with giving you money because you haven't shown me anything and you show me, you haven't shown me, you haven't shown me that you've got a team that knows how to use AI. Now, if you told me we we're using ChatGPT or we're skinning this and we've just plugged it in and here's our experiment, well, that's a totally different other issue. On top of which, okay, doing MVP with ChatGPT or other AI is super simple these days, super simple. So at least do that work and tell me if you're gonna build a technical product, show me that you can build technical product or you can experiment and hack with a technical product. Right now, you're making all these promises and I don't have any confidence that you can actually go build it. So go build something or change your pitch, not to include all the AI washing and, you know, things like that. And just be, you know, very straightforward with it. But what's going on is we're verging back on territory of um, not really thinking it through, doing idea validation and working all the details so that you have something to present in your deck. So there you have that's it for that one. It, we're, we're swinging the pendulum all over the place on this one, Peter. And so I really think that you should break things down into just a straight idea validation deck and just be straightforward and go black and white and test it, test it, test it, and then go from there. I understand. Creative guy, able to just jump into all the different decks. It's just not working for me. I'm having, I, I'm actually going backwards. I'm having a harder time, but I believe Peter's going to work it out. He's a great founder. Let's keep moving and let's do another one. And a lot of these principles are going to be the same. And we're going back here and... Okay, so now we've got feedback. This is a founder that went back and said, hey, this is the feedback I got, and I'm going to whip through it. I'm going to see if the feedback was integrated properly, all right? So here we are. So this company is called Spam Free Chat Commerce. The fact that I don't even have a title on this front slide, that's going to be an issue. Spam Free Chat Commerce. So I can chat and do commerce without spam. Okay, interesting. Okay, problem. Many small traders in emerging economies try to sell over mobile chat by spamming. Okay, yes, there's a lot of spam. Conversion rates can be low as 0.1%. Okay, way too much information, right? So what is the problem? So immediately I'm gonna say, figure out who your user is and who has the problem. Because right now, based on this, I don't know, does the shopper have the problem or does the buyer have the problem, right? So if you're saying, because immediately from the front slide, I said spam free commerce, that means I can buy without being spammed. I'm thinking it's for me personally as the buyer. But I'm looking at this problem slide, I'm going, oh, I think it might be for the seller that you can sell without spamming, right? Small traders in emerging economies. Okay, 2019, 70% respond, feel annoyed, you know, et cetera. Okay, so let's, let's continue. Replace spamming with soliciting messaging. So it looks like it's for the seller. So then demo, solicit messaging over mobile chat. Now, okay, this is where the language is an issue. I don't know how soliciting is different than spamming. For me, spamming is nothing but a lot of solicitations coming in and out. So you see how my mind, based on the language, and I fully respect all our international founders, our ESL founders. This is the reason ChatGPT is there, and but there's no excuse for you because the investor is not going to get it, right? You don't want to shoot yourself in the foot and prevent it from the investor actually starting to understand and recognize what you're doing by having the language all over the place. So for me, spamming... It's just a bunch of solicitations all one after another. So I don't understand how this is different. So we're gonna have to figure out the language and see this video here. I'm not gonna watch a video. Just letting you know, not watch a video. So how is it different? So market, um, 3 billion. So 
again, 3 billion daily active users, that's not your market. It's not your market. How many people would actually use this? How many traders, how many commerce people, how many people selling could actually use it? And what are they going to pay? One solicitation post per quarter per estimate. Okay, now we're getting in a business model. So we're all over the place. Competition, uh, I said this before. Th are we saying that Instagram is your competition? It's not. I don't understand all these things here. This is way too complicated for me. Go to market. I have an existing database. That's not a go to market and I'm going to harness the grow. That's just you pie in the sky. You're not telling me an actual technique. You're not explained to me and use viral engineering. One-on-one -on -one viral coefficient. I don't know what that means, but as soon as you say viral, you are making a huge assumption that you can make something go viral and that's just not going to happen right? You can say we're using a video content strategy and that's going to help us, but this does not, this does not bode well. So we're going to keep, keep going here. Traction. Okay. I know you have your user built test the airtime reward. I, I don't understand what this means. I said this the last time. So this deck hasn't improved. All you've done. Okay. And, and, and I'm going to hold you to this uh, founder is that you have not improved the, the narrative of the deck. Okay. And then now we got another video, not going to watch it. And you're raising 500,000, 10 million users per month. Do you know how, you know how hard that is? You're not going to do that. Okay. So let me break this down for you in terms of what your deck should say. If you're trying to sell your solution for people who are trying to sell online, there are 30 million people trying to sell on the internet using spam messaging and customers aren't liking it. We have created a new way to sell over messaging that's different than a spam message using whatever AI or something like that. Here's how it works. This is how it worked before and this is how the messages are different or there's an opt-in or something along those lines or the customer say, yeah, I want to get these messages from this place. Something, you know, we use chatbots. I don't know what this is, right? And then you're telling me, you know, we did an MVP and we got all these users and there's no data, you know, whatsoever. And the language is confusing and you're making a lot of assumptions and you're just trying to sound super impressive. And I'm just going to say, you probably haven't put in the work, right? You're just trying to raise money for something that you think is a good idea, but you haven't put in the work to validate with investors. And therefore it's coming out of your pitch deck and I'm not seeing what I need. Now, prove me wrong. Please, founder, prove me wrong. You may be sitting on all this information and all this traction and all this good stuff that's not coming out of the pitch deck. Well, then you've got a massive issue of this gap between what is really happening and your pitch deck, and you're going to have to work on it. And I'm going to send you some resources to startups.com for the free pitch deck stuff, and this is where I'm going to leave it. We have a lot of free stuff to help you, but this pitch deck has not improved from the last time. And I'm going to hold you accountable to this. I'm not going to review this until I see substantial improvements. And this is for everybody else. Don't keep sending me your pitch decks until you show substantial improvement and you've tested with other people. I should not be the one that you're testing with. I should be the one you're getting feedback from. And, you know, it gets me hot on the collar because we don't want to waste anybody's time, especially the viewers and all this stuff. So consider this your warning. Everybody, if you get these pitch decks reviews, don't send it back until you have substantially improved it. That's it for now on this one. Hopefully this was helpful. Didn't see any Q&A come through the chat or anything like that, unless I completely spaced on it. But hang out with us at startups.com if you're interested. Join us at startups.com. You can come and you can do all sorts of different workshops and I'll go through your pitch decks. If you're interested in your own pitch deck review, email it to advisor at startups.com. If you're in the startups.com community, we'll give you a total review. We'll work with you on that one. It doesn't have to turn into content. If you're outside of startups.com, well, that's what we do. We use this for content so everybody can learn together. And that's our value exchange and how we do it to give you help on your pitch deck. We are here every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Pitch deck reviews happen every Tuesday. Join us for the next episode because I have some really great guest speakers coming up. Hope you have all enjoyed this. Thank you so much. We'll see you in the next episode. Stops.com live. Talk to you soon.